In the previous You Can Do TV videos, you learned about the RF amplifier, tuner, mixer, and sound strip. In this video, you will learn about the video detector stage contained in the IF amplifier section, the first video amplifier stage, parts of the NTSC composite video signal, the AGC and sync separator stage, the horizontal oscillator, and the vertical oscillator and output amplifier stage. In order for the picture to come across organized, the television receiver must be in step or synchronized with the video transmitted from the TV station. The video signal you will be studying is the NTSC composite video format you will learn how this signal is used in the television receiver. We must begin with the mixer stage where the 45.75 MHz video IF carrier is created. The video IF signal is passed from the mixer stage to the video IF amplifier section in the same manner as the sound IF as you may recall from the You Can Do TV Part 3 video. The purpose of the video IF amplifier section in a color television receiver is to amplify the video IF bandwidth and not the sound IF bandwidth. This is done to prevent any intercarrier buzz which may be generated during the video detection process. Within the video IF amplifier section are a number of traps which filter out adjacent TV channels which usually heterodyne along the desired TV channel. Two such traps are designed into the first video IF amplifier stage. As you may recall from the TV Part 3 video, inductor L1 and capacitor C4 trap out the sound IF carrier. Capacitor C5 and inductor L4 form a tuned resonant trap circuit centered at 47.25 MHz. This trap circuit notches out the sound IF carrier to the adjacent TV channel. The video IF signal is amplified by transistor Q1. Inductor L6 allows the 45.75 MHz video IF signal to be adjusted to a 50% amplitude on the characteristic curve. When tuning the first video IF amplifier stage, this adjustment helps shape the video IF bandpass characteristic. The video IF is coupled through capacitor C9 and into the second video IF amplifier stage. The video IF passes through resistor R5 and into the base of transistor Q2. Inductor L7 allows the 42.17 MHz color subcarrier to be adjusted at 50% on the video IF characteristic curve. This adjustment will further define the video IF bandpass. The video IF signal is coupled to the third video IF amplifier stage through capacitor C17. The third video IF amplifier stage provides higher gain than the previous two amplifier stages, which makes it susceptible to breaking into oscillation. Capacitor C19 is used as a neutralizing capacitor to prevent oscillation from occurring within this stage. The video IF is coupled through capacitor C21 to the primary of transformer T2's winding. 
The arrangement of transformer T2's primary and secondary windings provides signal coupling to the video detector stage. The tuned tank circuit just below T2 is a 41.25 MHz sound IF trap. This trap helps to define the skirt selectivity of the video IF bandpass. The video IF amplifier section provides signal gain for the sound IF prior to the IF sound trapping, synchronizing and blanking signals, video, and color signal information. If the video IF section is not functioning properly, improper voltages will develop and problems may seem to arise out of other sections of the television receiver because of the video IF section. Problems will arise with the video IF amplifiers. For example, sometimes a television receiver will have a raster but no sound or picture. This is classified as a complete loss of signal. A complete loss of signal occurs when a tube or transistor in the video IF is faulty or no good. A complete loss of signal can also be caused by problems in the front end of the television receiver. When the video IF amplifier section is AGC controlled, the problem of no signal may result out of the AGC circuitry. The automatic gain control biased into the video IF amplifier determines the degree of amplification the video IF offers the rest of the television system. When the AGC is functioning improperly, the trouble may seem to be in the video IF stages. A partial loss of signal is also possible with the video IF section. This can be identified by a lack of contrast in the picture or a 60 cycle buzz added to the sound output. A partial loss of signal may also have snow in the picture. Snow can be the result of a malfunction or incorrect setting of the AGC section. Other sections of the receiver may contribute to snow in the picture, such as a defective tuner, mixer, video detector, or video amplifier. Improper alignment of the video IF can be noticed by the television picture appearing smeared. This smearing can be caused by aging components losing their effectiveness, or a replaced component changing the bandwidth characteristics of the entire video IF section. A loss of fine detail may result in the picture when there is a poor high frequency response in the video IF section. The hue or color phase may also be affected when the video IF section is completely off in alignment. Before you proceed to the video detector stage, we will now pause for a short review of the material just discussed. The video IF signal is generated in the mixer stage by the process of heterodyning. Each stage of the video IF amplifier section boosts the video IF signal higher in amplitude according to its tuned bandwidth. Resonant circuits are used to trap out unwanted signals and to help form the characteristic bandpass in which amplification occurs to the video IF signal. Problems occur in the video IF section such as a complete loss of signal, a partial loss of signal, and improper IF alignment. This concludes review number one. Now stop the video and complete section A in your student workbook. In this portion of the video, you will learn about the video detector stage. In this block diagram, the video detector stage is combined with the block also containing the video IF section. The video detector is often referred to as the second detector of the television receiver. This is because the received visual carrier is changed to a lower frequency intermediate video carrier of 45.75 MHz. As you recall, the video IF originates in the diode detector of the mixer stage. The video detector, or second detector, takes the video IF signal from the last video IF amplifier stage and removes the carrier component and then leaves what is termed the baseband or composite video signal.
The video IF signal is coupled into transformer T2. The secondary of transformer T2, combined with capacitor C1, forms a tuned tank circuit. Diode D1 rectifies the amplitude modulated video IF signal. The output of diode D1 is a pulsed DC voltage at the frequency of 45.75 MHz. Capacitor C2 and inductor L1 filter out birdies or tweets which would be passed on to the video amplifier. Birdies or tweets are a form of interference generated inside the television and re-radiated back into the tuner, setting up oscillations. Transformer T3, capacitor C4, and resistor R3 make up a bridged T trap. This trap circuit filters out any 4.5 MHz sound IF which may be mixed with the video IF. All other frequencies are passed through this trap circuit. Resistor R4 and inductor L2 are connected in a shunt peaking configuration. Inductor L3 and resistor R5 are connected in a series peaking configuration. Both shunt and series peaking enhances the overall video response of the video detector. Since the majority of video detectors are DC coupled to the video amplifier, Resistor R6 establishes the proper signal level to the video amplifier. TP is the test point used to sample the demodulated video signal. The video IF signal is in envelope form and is coupled through the tuned tank circuit. Diode D1 rectifies the video IF envelope and outputs voltage pulses determined by the amplitude of the modulation at that instant in time. The orientation of diode D1 determines whether the composite video signal will have a positive or negative polarity. A video signal which has a positive polarity is where the sync pulses are above reference ground. A negative polarity video signal is where the sync pulses are below reference ground. The video detector outputs a negative going composite video signal into the video amplifier stage. Now let's examine what a composite video signal is. A composite video signal is composed of picture information which is scanned onto the TV screen. This includes the black and white brightness or luminance levels and phase shifted color subcarrier information. The color burst is used as a reference for the color circuits within the color television receiver. Synchronizing pulses allow the television receiver to be timed exactly with the broadcast station and thus correctly organize the picture information on the TV screen. The composite video signal must be amplified in order to be used in other parts of the television receiver. Before examining the first video amplifier, we will pause for a review of the material just discussed. The video detector is sometimes thought of as the second detector in the television receiver. This is because the mixer stage is the first to change the visual carrier into a lower frequency signal. The same analogy applies when the video IF is changed into a composite video signal. A diode is used to rectify the video IF envelope into a composite video signal. By reversing the position of the diode in the circuit, the polarity of the detected video will switch either positive or negative. A 4.5 MHz trap circuit prevents the sound IF from mixing with the color subcarrier upon video detection. If this would occur, annoying sound bars would be present in the picture. You learned that there are two forms of peaking the video signal, series peaking and shunt peaking. 
Both forms of peaking enhance the response characteristics of the video detector stage. The composite video signal contains the picture information and the synchronization required to properly organize the picture information on the television screen. This concludes review number two. Now stop the video and complete section B in your student workbook. The next stage of the color television receiver is the first video amplifier stage. This stage amplifies the chroma or color portion of the video signal, the luminance or brightness levels, and the synchronization pulses of the composite video signal. The first video amplifier stage in most color television receivers will provide multiple outputs of the amplified composite video signal to other sections of the television system. One of these sections is the AGC and sync separator stage. He will learn more about the video amplifier section or luminous channel in another You Can Do TV video. The AGC and sync separator is the first stage to operate on the synchronization pulses of the composite video signal. This stage is very important for the proper operation of the television receiver. The AGC section represented within this block diagram is critical to the signal levels used throughout the color television receiver. Automatic gain control is needed because different TV broadcast stations are at different distances from the television receiver and operate at different power levels. The typical signal strength a television may receive would be in the range of 50 to over 100,000 microvolts. AGC allows the television receiver to adjust the gain of the IF amplifier section, where most of the amplification occurs, to appear as if the received television stations have the same incoming signal strengths. Fast-acting AGC circuits are required in televisions which are close to airports or are along flight paths of aircraft. Airplane flutter is a major cause of TV interference. Airplane flutter can be caused by atmospheric conditions, time of day, season of year, or by actual airplanes passing overhead. In the normal television signal broadcasted through the air, there are at least two waves the television receives. One wave is the direct wave. This wave comes directly from the TV broadcast station and hits the TV antenna. The second wave originates from the broadcast station, but is reflected by the ground, so therefore it is called a ground reflected wave, which is also received by the television receiver. The ground reflected wave is responsible for ghosts or double images appearing in the TV picture. A third wave is introduced when a moving object, such as an airplane, reflects the broadcasted signal in the direction of the television receiver. This form of reflective wave is known as a sky wave. The phase combined with the vector sum of the signals affects overall television reception. For this reason, automatic gain control is used in the color television receiver. Lower cost television receivers may use what is termed a simple AGC system. As you can see from the schematic shown here, the simple AGC only uses two components highlighted here. Once the IF signal is rectified, a portion of the composite video is filtered out by a capacitor. The capacitor removes any ripple and provides a steady DC voltage to be used for an AGC. The RF and IF amplifier sections now have an automatic gain control for various signal strengths. The simple AGC has a few limitations. One, a weak RF signal has a tendency to provide a low AGC voltage. This causes a greater signal to noise ratio and reduces RF amplifier gain. Two, 
Picture brightness, or luminance levels, affect the AGC voltage level. So when the picture would increase or decrease brightness, the AGC voltage would increase or decrease according to the picture content. 3. Noise pulses raise the AGC voltage being fed to the controlled amplifier section, which reduces its gain. The result is a grainier signal with worse signal-to-noise characteristics. When this occurs in a receiver, it is called noise setup. 4. The simple AGC system is slow acting since it must respond to frequencies as low as 30 Hz. Therefore, rapid signal changes such as airplane flutter will not be effectively eliminated by a simple AGC system. The diode noise gate is another means of noise cancellation. Diode D1 is used as the video detector. At the output of the video detector is another diode D2. Diode D2 is the noise gate positioned to conduct only on a positive video signal. Potentiometer R1 is the bias control which adjusts the negative polarity video signal just above zero volts, lifting it to a positive potential. With the video signal at a positive potential, diode D2 responds like a short circuit and passes the composite video signal. When the noise pulse extends beyond the sync tips of the video signal, the diode opens and the noise pulse is gated from the rest of the television receiver. In a transistorized AGC system, the operating point is important. As you may recall, a transistor may be biased either toward cutoff or saturation. Many AGC systems use the operating point of the transistor to control the gain of an amplifier section. This method of gain control is known as forward and reverse AGC. Shifting the operating point of a transistor toward saturation to control amplifier gain is known as forward AGC. Shifting the operating point of a transistor toward cutoff to control amplifier gain is called reverse AGC. As you can see from this diagram of a typical transistor power curve, the operating range for a forward AGC system is placed on the right side of the curve. With a reverse AGC system, the operating range is placed on the left side of the power curve. Since the right side of the power curve is more linear, most television receivers will use a forward AGC with the IF amplifier section. This is done because the IF amplifier section offers the most gain in the color television receiver and must be handled more gradually. Television receivers which use reverse AGC will normally have a nonlinear power curve toward cutoff. This aspect of reverse AGC makes it more usable for controlling the RF amplifier section. To better understand the forward reverse AGC system, let's examine two impedance match circuits. As you may recall from your basic electronic training, when the input and output impedance of two circuits are properly matched to one another, maximum power transfer occurs. In this example, you see circuit A being represented by a bar graph and circuit B also being represented by a bar graph. Notice that the gain of circuit B is also being represented by a bar graph. As you can see, when the impedance of circuit A increases and the impedance of circuit B remains the same, the gain at the output of circuit B decreases. The reason for this is the impedances of the two circuits are no longer matched. Even if we decrease the impedance of circuit A and keep the impedance of circuit B constant, the output gain of circuit B will still decrease. Now notice that when we keep the impedance of circuit A constant and vary the input impedance of circuit B to make it either larger or smaller than the matched value of circuit A, the output gain of circuit B decreases. The reason for this phenomenon is simple. When the impedances of the two stages are no longer matched, the gain of the circuit will suffer. As you recall from your basic electronic training, the gain of the stage will be at optimum value when the output impedance of one stage matches the input impedance of the second stage. When a transistor's input bias increases, the internal resistance of the transistor decreases. With the transistor operating in a tuned circuit, 
the transistor reacts to the change in input voltage, thus an impedance mismatch is set up in the circuit. As you can see from the bar graph, the impedance mismatch will result in a lower power gain for the stage. In this way, the operating point of the transistor is shifted either toward cutoff or saturation and can be used in a forward or reverse AGC system. As was just mentioned, some television receivers are designed to use the AGC voltage to control the gain of the RF amplifier section. When controlling the gain to the RF amplifier stage, a form of delayed AGC is used. The word delayed, as in delayed AGC, does not refer to time. Instead, it refers to signal strength. In a delayed AGC system, the gain of the stage is maximum until a preset signal threshold is crossed. Once the signal strength crosses over this preset threshold, the gain of the stage is reduced or attenuated. In a weak signal area, the delayed AGC system is ideal. A better method of AGC control is known as keyed AGC. AGC uses the positive polarity sync pulses from the video detector and the pulses from a winding in the horizontal output transformer to establish the AGC voltage. Basically, the sync pulse amplitude level of the incoming signal controls how hard the transistor goes into conduction. When the transistor conducts, a pulse from the horizontal output transformer is allowed to pass through the transistor and into the AGC control line. The transistor is normally biased into cutoff until the sync pulses of the incoming signal allow the transistor to conduct. Keyed AGC allows only the peak amplitude of the incoming signal to control the AGC level of the amplification sections within the television receiver. Picture brightness of the video signal will not affect the keyed AGC voltage because only the sync pulse amplitude of the incoming signal is sampled. Noise cancelling keyed AGC is a combination of noise cancellation with delayed keyed AGC. This system uses noise cancelling prior to automatic gain control. The noise cancelling section is placed across the video amplifier's input and output. Within the noise cancelling section is a noise gate, which works on the same principle as the diode noise gate discussed earlier. The noise gate inverts the noise pulse by 180 degrees. The output from the noise gate is added to the output from the video amplifier where the noise is cancelled. The AGC portion is a delayed AGC system. The amplified noise cancelling circuit is the next system you will examine. This circuit works similar to the system just mentioned, except amplification is applied to the noise pulse. The bias level is adjusted so the sync tips are just below the cutoff point of the transistor. When a noise pulse occurs in the video signal, the transistor will conduct and amplify the noise pulse. Since the output of the first video amplifier is 180 degrees out of phase, the amplified noise pulse will cancel the noise in the composite video signal. At this time, we will pause for a review of the material just discussed before learning about the sync portion of the AGC and sync separator stage. You learn that there are three basic forms of waves. Direct waves, ground reflected waves, and sky waves. The phase and vector sum of these waves will dictate television reception. You learned how the diode noise gate blocks noise pulses by allowing a lifted video signal to conduct through the diode noise gate. When a noise pulse arrives at the diode gate, the diode will stop conducting because the noise pulse will be below the bias level of its DC operating point. 
The automatic gain control works to maintain a certain video amplitude level regardless of varying signal strength. You also learned about six methods of AGC. Simple AGC, forward and reverse AGC, delayed AGC, keyed AGC, noise cancelling keyed AGC, and amplified noise cancelling keyed AGC. Simple AGC basically filters the output from the video detector stage and converts it to a level DC voltage. This DC voltage is then fed back to the amplifier stages and used as a gain control. The simple AGC method is very susceptible to noise and changes in picture brightness. Forward and reverse AGC is really two methods of automatic gain control. A television receiver may use either one or both of these methods. Forward AGC refers to the right side of the transistor's operating curve and is used mainly for controlling the gain to the IF amplifier section. Reverse AGC refers to the left side of the transistor's operating curve. Reverse AGC is not often used because of its poor linearity, but when it is, reverse AGC finds its application in controlling RF amplifier gain. In a delayed AGC system, the word delayed refers to a preset threshold which the signal strength must rise above before AGC is reduced. A television signal below this preset threshold will be provided with maximum amplification. Keyed AGC offers the television system a way of only looking at the sync pulse amplitude of the entire incoming video signal. Keyed AGC works by biasing a transistor to only conduct when a positive polarity sync pulse is present. The amount of conduction will depend on the actual sync pulse amplitude. A special winding located within the horizontal output transformer will be switched through the transistor and will determine the amount of AGC line voltage to the amplifier stages. You also learned about noise cancelling keyed AGC. A noise cancelling circuit is bridged across the video amplifier stage to eliminate noise. The keyed AGC portion in this system uses a delay threshold to provide maximum gain to a range of weak signal strengths. The amplified noise cancelling circuit simply amplifies the incoming noise pulse which extends beyond the video sync pulses. The noise pulse is amplified to a certain degree and added to the first video amplifier's output, thus cancelling the noise. This concludes review number three. Now stop the video and complete section C in your student workbook. In this part of the video, you will learn how the sync pulse information within the NTSC composite video signal is recovered. Both at the transmitter and within the television receiver, are local oscillators which generate the timing for the placement of picture information on the TV screen. In order for the television receiver to be in sync with the TV station, synchronization pulses are inserted between lines of picture information. These synchronization pulses mark the exact phase and timing of the TV station's local oscillators. The television receiver processes these sync pulses and locks its own local oscillator to the oscillators of the TV broadcast station. In this manner, the television station and the television receiver are in step or in sync and the TV reproduces an intelligible picture. Now let's take a look at the sync separator section of the AGC and sync separator stage. The sync separator provides four functions within the television receiver. One, separation of the sync pulses from the composite video signal. Two, amplification of the sync pulses. Three, DC restoration. And four, noise spike immunity. 
The first two, separation and amplification, are self-explanatory. However, the third, DC restoration, may not be so well understood. When a signal is AC coupled, such as with a capacitor from one stage into another, the DC components within the signal are still present. However, they are no longer held at the original DC voltage reference. The absence of a DC voltage reference may cause the signal to float or waver in amplitude as if impressed with an AC ripple. Restoring the DC voltage reference to the waveform is what DC restoration is all about. However, once a video signal is degraded by low frequency roll off, DC restoration will not improve upon the video waveform. DC restoration, as used in a television receiver, only reestablishes the AC coupled signal to a DC reference voltage. When applied to the sync separator stage of a color television receiver, DC restoration is used to line up the sync pulses so they all occur at the same DC amplitude level. The electronic device which provides DC restoration and lines up the sync pulses is called a clamping diode. A clamping diode, depending upon its orientation in the circuit, will grab the most positive or negative amplitude excursions of the waveform and tie them to the DC reference voltage. The reference voltage could be ground or a positive or negative DC bias. Noise spike immunity occurs as a benefit of the device either operating very close to cutoff or saturation. This concept was explained in the previous section with the diode noise gate. The AGC and sync separator stage receives a positive polarity video signal from the first video amplifier stage. As you may recall, a positive polarity video signal is with the sync pulses up above reference ground. At this point, the sync pulses must be isolated from the rest of the composite video signal. This is accomplished by a sync separator or sync clipper circuit. Any circuit which can be biased to only look at the sync pulses and as a result cause current to flow can be used to separate the sync pulse information from the rest of the NTSC composite video signal. Here you see a diode clipper circuit which performs sync pulse separation. The circuit does not offer amplification to the recovered sync pulses. Notice there are only four components to the simple circuit. A diode, a capacitor, and two resistors. Capacitor C1 and resistor R1 provide a time constant of approximately 635 microseconds or 10 horizontal lines. Because of this long time constant, an average voltage level directly related to the duty ratio of the sync pulses will be developed. This duty ratio is used to automatically scale the composite video signal so the voltage level used to bias the diode is at or just above the blanking level or base of the sync pulses. In this manner, all of the NTSC composite video signal will be masked except for the sync information. The output of the diode clipper will only be the sync pulse information. A transistorized sync separator is the next step from the diode clipper. Inside the transistor, between the base and emitter, is a diode. The transistor is biased to function as a diode clipper and provides amplification to the sync pulse as an added benefit. As a result of the transistor amplification, a positive video signal which is present at the base of the transistor will yield a negative polarity sync pulse at the output. The only disadvantage the transistor offers is the output is inverted. So if there is a positive video signal present at the base of the transistor, a negative sync pulse will be produced at the output. The signal can be re-inverted to a positive sync pulse polarity with the use of another transistor stage. As you can see, there are different types or durations of sync pulses outputted from the sync separator circuit. To simplify things, keep in mind that there are only two uses for the pulses shown here horizontal and vertical synchronization. 
you may recognize the first group of sync pulses highlighted here. These are known as horizontal sync pulses. Horizontal sync pulses are placed at the end of each horizontal scan line to initiate horizontal retrace which moves the electron beam inside the picture tube back to the left side of the screen. Notice that when there is picture information it is placed just before each horizontal pulse. Next there are two groups of six pulses called equalization pulses. Equalization pulses are actually short horizontal pulses which occur at twice the frequency of the horizontal sync pulses. Equalization pulses can be thought of as stepping stones used to maintain the timing of the horizontal oscillator. The vertical sync pulse, which is somewhat hidden, is placed at the bottom of each screen scan. The vertical sync pulse initiates vertical retrace which moves the electron beam inside the picture tube back up toward the top of the screen. You may have noticed that the vertical sync pulse is notched with what appears to be upside down equalization pulses. These pulses serve the same purpose as equalization pulses but are not called equalization pulses. These pulses are known as serration pulses. Serration pulses are used to maintain the timing of the horizontal oscillator during the vertical sync pulse interval. Without serration pulses, the horizontal oscillator would stand a chance of drifting off frequency. Now that we understand the sync separator and the sync signals which it outputs, we will now pause for a review of the material just discussed. You learn that the sync pulses in an NTSC composite video signal are a means of conveying the timing of the local oscillators at the TV station to the television receiver. Using the sync pulses, the television receiver is able to properly reconstruct a picture. A sync separator provides four functions, sync pulse separation, amplification of the sync pulses, DC restoration, and noise spike immunity. A diode clipper circuit works by masking all but the sync pulse information with a predetermined voltage level. This voltage level biases the diode off until a sync pulse adds to the biased voltage and causes the diode to conduct passing the sync pulse. The transistorized sync separator is based on the same principle as the diode clipper but offers amplification to the recovered sync pulse. You learn that there are two basic uses for sync pulses, horizontal and vertical synchronization. A horizontal sync pulse is placed at the end of each line of picture information to initiate horizontal retrace. You also learn that there are two groups of six equalization pulses. The first group of six equalization pulses is just before the vertical sync pulse and the second group of six equalization pulses is immediately following the vertical sync pulse. Equalization pulses occur at twice the rate as horizontal synchronization pulses and help maintain the timing of the horizontal oscillator. The vertical sync pulse is placed at the bottom of the screen to initiate vertical retrace. The vertical sync pulse is notched with what is called serration pulses. Serration pulses are used to keep the horizontal oscillator from drifting off frequency during the vertical sync pulse interval. This concludes review number four. Now stop the video and complete section D in your student workbook. Having been introduced to the different sync pulses within the color television receiver, it is now time to dive deeper into how the sync pulses are used. In this portion of the video, you will examine how the horizontal and vertical pulses are separated and applied to the television's deflection oscillators. You will also learn how the signals from these oscillators control the motion of three electron beams inside the picture tube or cathode ray tube.
Let's begin by realizing that the only difference between the horizontal and vertical sets of pulses is the duration and frequency in which they occur. The amplitude of each pulse remains the same. Here you see the horizontal oscillator stage. The horizontal oscillator stage uses a circuit called a differentiator. The differentiator is a high pass filter which has a time constant of approximately 0.1 microsecond. This time constant is 50 times smaller than that of the horizontal sync pulse. The differentiator converts the recovered sync pulses, which are basically square waves, into sharp voltage spikes. These voltage spikes should not be confused with noise spikes which enter the television receiver prior to the differentiator, such as through the RF or IF sections. Notice that the voltage spikes produced by the differentiator occur at the leading and lagging edges of the square wave sync pulses. Also notice that the leading edges of certain pulses are equally spaced from one another. This equal timing of voltage spike pulses provides the horizontal oscillator with a controlled timing reference. Now let's examine the horizontal oscillator and see how these voltage spikes are used. Today's modern television receivers use integrated circuits to generate the required internal signals, such as with the horizontal oscillator stage. If we would look inside the integrated circuit which provides the horizontal timing, you would find a form of multivibrator used. Since the multivibrator was covered in UCANDU's VT206 oscillator video, we will not go into detail of its operation. Only half of the waveform is used to synchronize or trigger the horizontal oscillator. Because of the circuit design of the horizontal oscillator or the multivibrator circuit, only the voltage spikes which occur at a regular timing interval are used to trigger the horizontal oscillator. Notice that some of the voltage pulses are not seen by the multivibrator and have basically no effect on its operation once a timing lock is established. A horizontal hold is then used to fine tune the frequency of this stage. The horizontal oscillator generates square waves which are transformed into sawtooth waves by a capacitor located in its output circuit. Since the sawtooth waveform is coupled out of the horizontal oscillator stage through a capacitor, the sawtooth waveform becomes an AC voltage. A vast majority of new color television receivers contain a horizontal automatic frequency control, or AFC, built into the front end of the horizontal oscillator stage. The horizontal AFC is used to null the frequency of the horizontal oscillator with the incoming sync pulses. Here you see a horizontal automatic frequency control circuit. There are two inputs and one output to the horizontal AFC. The first input signal comes from the sync separator. The second input is the sawtooth waveform generated from the horizontal oscillator. The horizontal AFC uses the sync signal as a phase reference to compare the phase of the sawtooth waveform. When a phase difference occurs, the horizontal AFC will output a DC error voltage. If the horizontal oscillator frequency is too high compared to the sync pulse frequency, the sawtooth waveform will lag the sync pulse and the DC error voltage will be positive. If the horizontal oscillator frequency is equal to the sync pulse frequency, the sawtooth waveform will be centered or nulled with the sync pulse and the DC error voltage will be zero. If the horizontal oscillator frequency is too low compared to the sync pulse frequency, the sawtooth waveform will lead the sync pulse and the DC error voltage will be negative. The relationship between the frequency drift of the horizontal oscillator and the polarity of the DC error voltage may be the opposite of what was just described, depending upon the television model at hand. When there is an error in the horizontal oscillator frequency, the DC error voltage may be a little too high or too low. In this event, 
the oscillator changes in frequency according to the DC error voltage, but the frequency change is too much. The DC error voltage is again produced to correct the error. This searching back and forth for the correct frequency is called hunting. Horizontal hunting can be recognized in the television picture by the image appearing contorted in places on the screen. Examples of contortion would be horizontal pulling, a horizontal hook, S-bending, and pie crusting. The sawtooth waveform is coupled out of the horizontal AFC and oscillator stage and into the horizontal output amplifier. You will learn about the horizontal output amplifier stage later in this You Can Do TV video series. The next stage you will learn about is the vertical deflection and output amplifier. The vertical deflection stage receives its input from the sink separator. Instead of differentiating the sink pulses like the horizontal oscillator stage, the vertical section uses the opposite process, called integration. Integration, as used in the television receiver, looks at the average duty ratio of the incoming sink pulses. A sync pulse will occur at a certain timing interval and will have a specific amplitude and duration. As you may recall, the amplitude of the sync pulse does not change. These three factors determine the power of a pulse. The integrator, which is basically a low pass filter, is designed with a long time constant which determines what the average duty ratio should be. The integrator builds up a voltage when the average duty ratio of the incoming horizontal sync pulses is above average. Since the duty ratio of the vertical sync pulse is greater than the average horizontal sync pulse, the integrator will gradually build up a voltage. Once this build up in voltage rises above a preset threshold, it will trigger the vertical multivibrator to the correct frequency. The vertical multivibrator will output square waves which are transformed into sawtooths just as with the horizontal deflection oscillator. It is common practice for a television receiver to be without a vertical automatic frequency control. The vertical output amplifier is basically class A or AB. This power amplifier has a frequency response down to 1 Hz. Notice that there are three controls to this vertical stage, a vertical hold, a height control, and a linearity adjustment. The vertical hold fine-tunes the vertical multivibrator frequency. The height control adjusts the amplitude of the sawtooth waveform. The linearity adjustment eliminates any curvature in the trace portion of the sawtooth. We will now pause for a review of the material just discussed. Each type of synchronizing pulse has its own timing duration or pulse width. The horizontal oscillator stage contains a differentiator or high pass filter. The differentiator transforms the rise and fall times of the sync pulses into positive and negative voltage spikes as you can see here. The voltage spikes which occur at the proper timing interval are used to maintain the timing of the horizontal oscillator or multivibrator stage. The horizontal automatic frequency control, or AFC, compares the phase of the square wave emerging from the sync separator with the phase of the sawtooth waveform. The difference of phase generates an error voltage which is used to place the horizontal oscillator back on the proper frequency. Hunting results when the generated error voltage, for a time, 
overcompensates to correct the drift and frequency of the horizontal oscillator. Hunting problems can usually be seen in the television picture as a form of contortion. The vertical deflection oscillator or multivibrator is triggered by the output of the integrator circuit. The integrator or low pass filter only builds up a voltage when a longer than average sync pulse duration is sustained, such as during the vertical sync pulse. The vertical deflection oscillator is triggered when the integrator voltage reaches a preset threshold. This concludes review number five. Now stop the video and complete section E in your student workbook. Review this video often to ensure a solid foundation of your ongoing television experience. Thank you.